Hey, I'm Robin Wilt. I'm a Brighton Town board member and also a 2020 candidate for Congress in New York's 25th Congressional District. I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we usually have our COVID-19 community check-ins and updates at this time, but we're switching it up like we did last week and doing an Ask Me Anything town hall. And today we have uh, ASL interpretation by Sage Nagy and Mabel Nahara. I want to thank you for your help today to make sure that this uh, discussion is accessible for everybody in our community. And then our, our questioner today is Ashley Gant, but of course the questions come from you. So I'll be attempting to answer all of the questions that you put forth in Facebook over the past week and um, anything else that Ashley thinks might be relevant. So let's get started. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Robin, for having me. Um, I guess I'll start with the first question that we have. And I think a lot of people in Rochester are thinking this, especially um, in light of our own school district here. So our first question is, how do you plan to improve the public education system that is failing many students in Rochester and across the US? That is a terrific question. And I love the way that it's framed because it talks about the fact that our educational system is failing, not our students. So I, I think that it's important to note that our educational system, particularly in our most vulnerable and our uh, poverty stricken communities is being asked to do far more than just educate our, our children. I think it's also important to note that in our educational system as it is organized right now, the quality of one's education is highly dependent on the zip code in which you live. And that's unacceptable. And I don't think that we can change these circumstances without re-envisioning education in this country, which is largely now funded through property taxes. I think it's time that we made tran a transformative investment in our children, in our teachers, in our schools, and had a fundamental re-envisioning of the unjust and inequitable funding that currently represents our public education system. I, I definitely back plans to triple Title I funding and Title I funding is funding to our school districts most in need because of the poverty metrics of those communities that they serve. That's definitely part of what we need to address the problem of inequitable education. But I also like Senator Bernie Sanders 10 point plan for improving education. I think it correctly focuses on the many ways our educational system is failing our children currently. It's called the Thurgood Marshall Plan, and it's named for the Supreme Court Justice who, as an attorney, argued the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education case and that found segregation in our schools unconstitutional. So the 10 points of the plan are combating racial discrimination in school segregation. And I think it's important to note here that Rochester Monroe County has the most segregated educational border in the country. That is the border um, between Penfield Central School District and the Rochester City School District. And I will also highlight that that border is with the town of Brighton. Um, and secondly, it wants to end the unaccountable profit motive of charter schools uh, right now charter schools are not held to the same standards as our public schools, yet they receive the same public investment. Um, we need equitable funding for schools overall. Uh, and again, that means that, that our property tax-based system uh, will ha have to be re-envisioned. We need to strengthen um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act idea that services are, are um, uh, special needs students. We need to give teachers a, 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 a pay raise to empower them to teach and build those relationships. Um, this, so, and then we need to expand after school and summer education programs. Um, we need to make our schools community schools. So that means universal school meals, um, 
improving school infrastructure to accommodate some of the services that they already provide, but we don't provide within that infrastructure, that setting, that school setting. And finally, I think we need to make schools a safe and inclusive place for all. And again, so that goes back to, you know, combating racial discrimination and segregation. Um, so some of the specific proposals include just federal, uh, boosting federal funding for our community uh, driven desegregation efforts, expanding access to English as a second language instruction, increasing accountability for charter schools and um, also making sure that fundings for all communities, indigenous communities, Puerto Rico and our other territories is equitable. So um, I would think, I, I would propose increasing funding $5 billion annually to expand access to uh, summer and after school programs, teen centers and tutoring and um, make sure that we truly provide a whole holistic and full service approach to educating our young people. So that's, that's just what I envision. And again, it's going to take the work of many, but if we just start by tripling Title I funding, we will be able to achieve a lot of those metrics. Sweet. Sweet. Thank you, Robin. That was like a very well rounded um, answer. So I think what I'm going to do is, because I have so many questions from other people, I'm going to ask um, someone else's question, and then I'm going to ask my own question, someone else's question, and then I want to ask my own question. That sounds I like a people, good plan. <laughs> I, want really, I want people to really see why, like, the young people in Rochester get down with me so much. So I know, like, I'm in the <laughs> activist community, and um, anytime we're thinking about who can we get to represent us, who can we get to talk about this, we always think Robin. We always think she's going to tell it like it is. She's not going to pull any punches. We're gonna know what it is if we ask Robin. So I think my question is, what is like who inspires you to be that truth teller, to be that person who is not gonna pull any punches and leave it all on the table? Oh my gosh, I think it it is everybody in the community who you know I really envision myself as being accountable to our community and people across all walks of life. They come to me and they depend on me to be that voice at the table a lot of times that is not represented. And so whenever people are proposing something, I think about the people who are not around the table. I literally do. And, and um, I, I try to make sure that those perspectives are represented. So, you know, when, when people come up in the community, I know that I'm going to be held account, <laughs> to yeah. account. So I make sure that I have solid answers for them. You know that I, you know I'm being a true voice for um, change, is a true voice to advocate um, to to improve their struggles. It's is it, it, and it is literally a full time job. It is just about building those relationships and showing up where you need to show up, and you know stepping out next when you need to. And, Period. And, and, and cajoling when 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 you can. So so that's what it's all about. Just making sure that you always have the people that you're representing, the people that you're focused on helping in in your mind's eye as you, as yes. you're around these tables. And what, so I know for a lot of us, a lot of us, um, so my introduction to politics was coming to your house, learning from you. And I know a lot of other young people, a lot of other activists, a lot of other people who are thinking about running for office and have ran for office, your house has been a place that we came to, not just to eat dinner, but to learn about um, power mapping, to learn about politics, to learn about who are the stakeholders in the community. Um, what makes you keep that table open for like young people to continue. Like your house is like an open door. Anybody can come at any time, eat, chill, watch TV, learn politics. What is it that makes you keep that, that openness? Oh my gosh. I, I think politics really is about building relationship. And so in order to build relationship, you have to keep that door open. And I also think that so many of us 
are, are discouraged from pursuing certain avenues. There's so many spaces in, in the power infrastructure that are not intended for us. I'm trying to create a space where everybody feels welcome to get involved in, in, in politics because it is about all of us being involved. We cannot be represented unless we are willing to, to be in all of those discussions. So we can't let those barriers to entry um, exist. We literally have to break them down. And the way you break them down is by building those relationships and making them accessible to people. So, you know, these are not things that we learn in school, right? We, we, our civic education does not include like how you run for office. And I think that's intentional. I, just like there are economic elites, there are political elites. There's like that 1% that runs the system. And so making sure that we save space for people to learn about the system, for people to access that system, and for people to get involved in that system by running is something that I, you know, is on my primary priorities. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate that. I mean, everybody in the community calls you Auntie Robin. So we appreciate you just opening up your table, opening up your house, opening up your office. For us to just come and go when we please to learn we just appreciate it thank you um we have another question and it's from uh folks who've been uh phone making from you they get this question a lot and it's do you support universal basic income yes <laughs> it is a question that i get a lot and yes i do support universal basic income and i, I want to explain this because ubi or universal basic income is not a new idea this has been uh, proposed for centuries for everyone from Thomas Paine to Richard Nixon. So across the political spectrum, the idea of UBI has existed. And in answering this question, I think it's important to point out that we already have existing examples of UBIs in this country. UBIs are nothing more than non-means tested programs that provide set amounts of cash assistance or subsidies to people on a routine basis. Social security disability is a UBI. People uh, of a certain age receive um, age or, or ability status receive regular cash subsidies from the government, which then they determine, not the government, they determine how to use to best support their needs. And of course, those UBIs are specifically for people who are not in the workforce, but similar programs also exist um, for people who are working. And that's like Alaska state oil revenue sharing program. Um, so programs like that existing demonstrate that UBIs would not likely discourage people from working. They would just provide additional support. And that's how a UBI would benefit the economy because regardless how much it costs or how you fund it, a study by the Roosevelt Institute uh, examined three different UBI plans. Um, $1,000 a month per adult payment, a $500 uh, month per adult payment, and a $250 a month per child payment. And what those researchers found is that all three programs resulted in higher spending power for lower income Americans. Now, there, there are certain programs in place now, our subsidy programs, which are deeply paternalistic that tell poor people how to spend their money and that paternalism would be mitigated if you replace those, those programs with uh, some type of cash transfer program like a UBI. And um, there's a wealth of research and literature that demonstrates the effectiveness of cash transfer over our so-called welfare programs. Um, but unlike welfare programs, UBIs would be much more straightforward to execute. Remember, I talked about not having those administrative uh, costs to, to accessing those programs. And, um, and what we see with our welfare programs is that people have to jump through hoops. And one of the issues that we face is that most people don't participate in every program that they're eligible for because in some cases they they don't realize that they're available you meet those eligibility requirements but um 
you do not realize that you can access those funds. And I think it's important to remember as we discuss UBI um, that they need to be equitable. A generous UBI could replace the need for most welfare programs, but it also could run the risk of redistributing a fund, uh, uh, redistributing funds away from those lowest income families that need it. So uh, we can't solely uh, address the issues of inequity with the UBI, but definitely it would, would help to reorient our social safety net um, to, to include a UBI. Sweet, sweet. Thank you, Robin. Um, so I'm going to go back to one of my own questions. Um, so we see you continually, time after time after time, showing up in the community for us, if it, whether that be a food giveaway or a protest or a rally. Um, we see you showing up. We also see you showing up for your own things. Um, as far as your campaign is concerned, we know that you sit on the board um, for Right in Town Hall. We also know that you're a mother and a wife. So my question is, how do you juggle it all? You have three children. <laughs> plus a whole bunch of other nieces and nephews in the community that you continue to show up for. So how do you do that? Oh my gosh. So um, it, I, it is, I am a workaholic, so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you know, but, but it literally is how I prefer to spend my time. Definitely my family is my priority. And, um, you know, during COVID-19, I've had all three of my boys home. So that has been a blessing. And we've been able to um, bond and, and experience each other like we wouldn't normally as young adults and parents. And, and so that has definitely um, granted me perspective. And what is important, and so um, I, I, I do enjoy showing up for the community. You know, if somebody reaches out to me, I want to be there. I want to be that resource. So I, I spend a lot of time just in, engaged in those ap- activities, being involved in the community because that's something that I, I take general, genuine joy in. So I, I love, um, I love that I'm accessible and that people will reach out to me because it also helps me to understand where our systems need improvement and highlights the struggles that people have with our current system. So um, it, it, it is one of my pastimes just to be engaged, organizing around these issues, organizing around personal individual issues that people have intersecting with our systems. And, and so, that's how I spend a lot of my free time. In addition to that, um, you know, I have, I, I'm, I'm human. <laughs> I have my, my, my things that I like to do. I used to be an avid runner. I used to run like every day. And there, there was a method to that madness because it was my thinking time. It was my um, time to, to really internalize uh, some of the solutions that, that, we're, we're trying to uh, implement, but um, I, I haven't been as good about doing that lately. So for self-care, I, I like to multitask. So I'll walk to the office. <laughs> for Which is a long walk. <laughs> it's like a two and a half mile walk. It's not re- re- ridiculously long, but, but I do try to walk several miles each week. And um, a little known fact is that while I'm walking, uh, I'll be listening to my old school, but I'll also be playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you can, you know, if you want to friend me, I'm no- notorious RRW. So, <laughs> so yeah, my, I, I, Robin, I don't even know anyone who still plays Pokemon Go. <laughs> Except for you. Oh, I know I'm probably more exposing myself as a nerd than anything else, but <laughs> but it's something that I could do while I walk. Sweet, sweet. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I want to make sure that I get back to the people who actually wrote in their questions and not be selfish. So this question is from Michael Burnell from Facebook, and he says, "What's the first issue you'll begin working on once you're elected to office?" Oh gosh, and that is a, a really good question, but it's really a difficult question because I don't 
don't think I can promise to work on any single issue in any particular order because as we've seen with COVID-19 and the uh, recent BLM protests, circumstances evolve that sometimes create opportunity and unexpected openings to advance the priorities that we never thought were possible before. So um, I do think though, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to discuss expanded and improved Medicare for all right now. Um, a poll was just conducted in May that asked the question, do you support or oppose Medicare for all? Which is all Americans, not just older ones, get health insurance through government's um, Medicare system. And nearly two thirds of the respondents answered yes. And only 27% were opposed and the rest were undecided. So um, I think the toll of ever rising medical costs and the fact that we have 60 million people uh, who lost their health insurance and over 40 million people who lost their jobs during COVID-19, Americans are willing to view health insurance as a government as responsibility now. So I think that creates some opportunity and space for us to create a Medicare for all system. Um, you know, I think most people think that they're way too financially burdened by medical bills in, in uh, recent years. And um, so that would be one of the uh, priority issues that, that I think that COVID-19 definitely has uh, created space to discuss. And I, I think we have similar discussions regarding reimagining public safety and addressing climate crisis um, that, that have emerged as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think addressing all of those gaps in our public safety net that have been exposed and exacerbated by this pandemic would be a legitimate place to start. Um, the problem, right. of course, we have so many. <laughs> and, right, and, right. So. Right. Um, again, this is me not wanting to be selfish. So I'm gonna go to the next person's question instead of my own. So this question is from Melissa Golden Gates and Wanda Lee from your last Ask Me Anything. They asked, what do you personally think is the most important actions allies can take to help bring about tangible change and confront systematic racism in the police departments and other institutions? Wow, another really good question. And, and I, I'm gonna keep it short and simple on this one. I think that allies need to be present. I think they need to be intersectional show up for all our issues across the board to generate unity. And I, I think that they need to show up. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, a lot of times uh, people ask me, you know, how can I help? How can I help? It, well, literally, it involves showing up, showing up in spaces where you don't think, where, where you don't necessarily think that you're needed. Um, and, and because this is really all of our fight. And, and I think too often we view these as niche issues when really these are universal issues that have to be tackled en masse with everybody um, who, who's a part, of, part and parcel to the, this, these systems. So um, yeah, just show up. Sweet, I agree with that. Um, so back to me being selfish, um, one of my own questions. So I can't remember a time in the last maybe five or six years that I've been involved in politics and trying to get uh, folks to run for office that the first stop wasn't your house. Um, for people who are just coming to politics and running for office, anytime we ask anybody to run, the first place we take them is to your house so that you and Nick can give us the rundown of what we need to do, how many signatures we need to collect, how many doors we need to knock on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I also know from working in politics that politics in Rochester is very, very difficult. And if you do not toughen up, you'll get discouraged very easily. So my question is, what would you say to new folks coming into politics, wanting to make a change, having all this zeal um, to be the change they wanna see and then being discouraged? Like, what would you say to new folks coming um, up and wanting to run for political office? Okay, I would use an ex as an example that movie that AOC was in, or the documentary, um, Knock Down the House. And in it, she made a really poignant observation. She said, 
in order for one of us to win, a hundred of us have to run. And I, I just remember that so viscerally that sat on my heart because I, I think that it is discouraging how high the bar is. Um, so many of our representatives, especially at the federal level, are actual millionaires. And to combat, um, to contest a, a competitive race against somebody who has deep pockets, it is discouraging. Um, but I would say that we need to keep trying. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to show up. We need to make sure that no race is uncontested. I think that a lot of people have negative views of primaries, you know, where, you know, within one party, we are running against each other. But that is the way that the system is designed. And if we don't have primaries, that is a symptom of an unhealthy system. If we don't have this marketplace of ideas that is being contested, where, you know, different ideas are being vetted among the electorate, we can never make process, progress and we can never truly represent the electorate unless mm -hmm. we're having these discussions. So um, I, I would say be willing to be vulnerable um, and you can always come by my house. I never <laughs> encourage people from running. I will be real with you. I will tell you, you know, all of the barriers that you're going to face, but if you're willing to, to undergo that, I will support you every step of the way. I can attest to that hundred percent true. Um, thank you for that. I think the next question, and I just want to warn you, so I'm going to ask the next question. And then I was just on Audacious Believers and they did like a rapid round of fire questions. So we're going to do that. So I just want to okay. like warn you to get your heart ready. Right, but my other right. question is, so before COVID, we could come to your house, come to your office, come to one of your events. And one thing that we will see is that it's diverse. So there's always people of all classes, all social economic um, statuses. There's both white people, black people, Asian American people, rich people, poor people, middle class people at like at any point in your office, in your events. And my question is, how do you yeah. maintain that diversity? How do you keep that diversity in all of your everything that you do? Uh, again, I, I think when you're concerned with all of these intersectional issues, you meet a lot of people along the way and you you make sure that you're showing up for people so then they show up for you and it's building those bridges it's you know i have my my feet in so many different communities and my fingers in so many pies and so you know it takes that kind of cooperation um, to, to build coalition and build unity. And, and so that has just been one of the principles on which I operate. And uh, thankfully, um, it, it, you know, people show up because I show up for them. Sweet, sweet. Okay, so we're gonna do the rapid round of questions. Um, <laughs> let me know when you're ready. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be ready. So just let's just do it. <laughs> okay. Um, besides the community, what is one, who is one person in history that inspires you? Oh my gosh. Oh, there's so many, so many. I think, but really, um, oh my gosh, Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm is one of my favorites because she did not take any guff. And I think she's known for her political um, activism, for, for running for elected office, for her first in that regard. But really her proudest moments were her organizing moments, her ability to build community and consensus around important issues. And she just has so many sage, words of advice to, to all of us who are combating these systems. She is definitely one of my favorites. Sweet. Um, I, I almost knew you were going to say Trish, uh, Shirley Chisholm. Um, <laughs> my next question is, when you think of resilient, what comes to mind? Oh, gosh, resilient. OK, I'm trying to do, uh, answer these really rapid fire. Um, I, I think of our youth because they really 
uh, have, they're, they're malleable and they adjust to different situations. I mean, we just went through a full on pandemic and these youth have emerged stronger than ever, more committed than ever, um, and really unbowed by, by the circumstances that we just face. And they, they have so much um, opportunity uh, ahead of them. I just want to make sure that we build up our youth and we, you know, because they really are, um, our future is dependent on them and, and they are the most resilient uh, that I see in our community. Agreed. What's your favorite food? Chocolate of any kind, really. Really, Robin? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know you're not a chocolate lover, but I do chocolate. You know, if it's got chocolate in it, I will probably try it. I, I I'm not one to mix chocolate and fruit. I'm a purist, but yeah. Okay. Favorite color? Red. And what are you doing your downtime? My downtime, I read a lot. I read a lot, run. Read a lot and run. And when you think about the world you want your grandchildren to live in, what does that world look like? That was a good question. Just hold on. Shout out to me. That was a great question. Good job, Ashley. Good, good job. Okay. Um, it, well, Martin Luther King famously said, justice is what love looks like in public. So I would like to see a world that is just. Sweet. And what is your favorite thing about me? <laughs> I'm just saying. What is there not to love about you, Ashley? Though? Perfect answer. Perfect answer, Robin. You know I what I love, though? I, I love that you keep it real and you keep people honest. Thank you, you know, holding people accountable, it's, it, it's not easy. And I think especially when we're taking moral stances, it can be hard and it can be lonely. And mm -hmm. it, re it, it requires courage. And I am just so impressed by your courage day to day. And I, 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 mean, I you know, I love you to death, so. <laughs> oh, thank you, Robin. I think, thank you. Thank you for stroking my ego. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me to do these questions. We love you. We are voting for you. We can't wait until you win. Just thank you for like your tenacity and courage and always being out here. And thank you for allowing me to ask you questions. And you know, I can ask anything. So just thank you for inviting me and we appreciate it. And we're all rooting for you. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking those questions. And again, thanks as always for keeping it real. <laughs> You're welcome. I think that's the, I think that's the end. Yeah, I think so too. Everyone.